Hello, I'm Dr. Blair. I'm working with Elixinol to provide weekly lectures about cannabidiol and the benefits that can be achieved with this remarkable substance. Today I'm talking about Alzheimer's, dementia, and cannabidiol. I want to review some of the extraordinary benefits and some of the mechanisms of action that go into cannabidiol's effect on Alzheimer's disease. So we'll talk a little bit about the burden of disease, some of the conventional causes and treatments, as well as endocannabinoid deficiency. I'll mention and go into some detail about cannabidiol and some of the benefits that it offers and some of the specific pathways of action, as well as a specific treatment plan for using cannabidiol in Alzheimer's disease. And at the end, we'll answer some questions and I have some references for you. So when we're talking about the spectrum of dementia and brain disorders, we're talking about actually quite a number of things. There's neurodegeneration, there's Parkinson's disease, stroke, and then uh, traumatic brain injury, um, chronic uh, traumatic encephalitis and concussion. These can all lead to dementia in one sort or, or another. But my main focus today is going to be on Alzheimer's types of dementia. I'll go into some specifics on that and we'll run through some of some more of the things that I, I want to discuss about it. In the first place, how big is the problem? Well, it looks like some recalculation shows that Alzheimer's disease probably represents the third leading cause of death in, in the country. So it's risen up from the fifth location, uh, fifth cause, to, to, to be the third cause. Um, and it's accelerating. There are 5 million individuals right now who have Alzheimer's disease. And you have to remember that Alzheimer's only represents about 70% of the number of people with dementia. So Alzheimer's is really a, a subpopulation of the entire group with dementia. If we're talking about the number of dollars in today's dollars, 2015, we're really talking about $226 billion, and 70% of that is Medicare. And I want to point out that that's Medicare because it's important because uh, you and I are going to be funding that, and, and our children are going to be funding those particular expenses in years to come. There, this does not take into account <clears throat> the lost uh, time and the amount of energy that family care providers uh, use in terms of taking care of uh, people with Alzheimer's and family members. And that's not even to mention what could be a trillion dollar um, uh, ticket uh, and uh, charge by the year 2050 when uh, we reach a culmination of our, our geriatric folks and people who could have at the same rate of generation of uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, by that time. So a huge, huge expense and a huge drain on the economy. So let's look at some of the pathways of disease. Now, we've heard quite a bit about amyloid beta, this protein that forms in the nerve tissues in the cells in the brain that leads to a number of disorders. Uh, there are other factors, and so the exact mechanism that's involved with Alzheimer's is not completely figured out. We do know that the tau um, protein is a, a substance that is a causes neurofibratory tangles and interferes with the communication of the nerve cell. And that's actually as a result of a misfolding inside the nerve cell um, acting on uh, the the axon and some of the extensions of the axon to make connections with other cells. Clearly, there's a significant amount of inflammation going on inside the brain and inside the cell, and there's additional oxidative stresses that are happening there. Now, in addition, we have evidence to show that there is disruption of the blood-brain barrier. Essentially, that breaks down and substances that should not be going to the brain are coming to the brain, and they could cause some problems. There's information that is circulating that, that suggests that the, the lining of the blood vessels in the brain also play a major role in this disease process. 
So the conventional treatment, well, frankly, there is no effective treatment for Alzheimer's disease at the present time. They, it's unable to reverse the disease. There's nothing to stop the progression. So essentially, you've got a number of drugs that make people feel better, and there is some temporary measures to improve their cognition, but there's nothing that addresses the exact disease, nor does it prevent any of the progression or the problems. It's mostly about controlling the symptoms and helping families manage uh, the condition. If we look at the endocannabinoid system, then we start to see some of the mechanisms and a pathway that could be healing. We know that the endocannabinoid system is dysfunctional, um, in brain diseases, and particularly with Alzheimer's disease. We've got evidence for clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. I think a better term was dysregulation because there are imbalances in the agonists as well as the receptors that create problems, and those problems uh, tend to lose their balance, and we are, and are associated with specific diseases and specific problems. What causes these deficiencies? Best we can tell, it represents diets um, and drugs, toxins. These are the causes that we can identify right now, but we don't know exactly what's going on with this. This is much more plausible than some of the other suggestions for uh, the sources for why this disease takes place. I have to mention, though, that there is a genetic factor that goes into Alzheimer's disease, but it represents a minority of the number of people who are involved. The, the major action that we've got to look for is in terms of restoring the endocannabinoid system, and that's where I think uh, cannabidiol could do a lot. If we're looking for more of the evidence for endocannabinoid deficiency in the brain, we can see it in the excess number of uh, cannabinoid receptor type 2s that are occurring uh, there. We're also seeing low levels of endocannabinoids, those agonists that hook up with those receptors. In addition, some of the enzymes that are involved with the endocannabinoid system are showing uh, regulatory problems, high levels that should not be there. So in general, and along with the cytokines that are, are showing inflammation, we're seeing imbalances in the endocannabinoid system so that that homeostatic mechanism that really is supposed to control what's going on within the brain and within the body is mixed up. It's confused and it's not performing properly. So cannabidiol could offer a solution for this and we've got good evidence for doing it. Now cannabidiol comes from cannabis, but remember there are two kinds of cannabis. There's hemp and there's marijuana. Marijuana has the psychoactive portion, but the hemp portion uh, it has, holds the majority of the cannabidiol, and that's the healthy part. Cannabidiol is safe, it's legal, and it's effective for a wide range of problems. It causes no reaction, no toxicity, and no interactions. And cannabidiol, most importantly, can restore the endocannabinoid system, so you can get it rebalanced using cannabidiol. Now, if we're looking at cannabidiol's effects on the brain, they're quite profound. We see that cannabidiol is going to regulate the endocannabinoid system. It's going to get the brain back into balance and restore the, the measures and the receptors and the agonists, as well as the enzymes that need to be acting there. It's going to restore neuromodulation. That's probably one of the key mechanisms for restoring some of the memory and the cognitive function these people have as well as promoting neurogenesis, the formation of new connections, uh, connections in, in the nerves um, with other nerves so that there is communication going on and there's a rebalancing of the brain function. It's reducing immune cells. Now, we know that the brain has a great deal of inflammation, especially with Alzheimer's disease and a number of other conditions, so for instance, depression. What cannabidiol has particular impressive results is, is actually reducing the number of glial cells that are the macrophages of the brain that, and they reduce those. That results in a decrease of inflammation, of inflammatory substances, and a general calming of the brain. Now, another unique aspect we usually think of um, in terms of 
uh, um, the blood-brain barrier is restoring the uh, continuity of the membrane, a lot like the gut. It's so similar in terms of reducing the leakage that can occur with the blood-brain barrier, as well as leakage in the gut, in, in the membranes that are there. But it reduces this blood-brain barrier so it doesn't allow all those molecules to be coming through that don't belong in the brain area. It, it seals up those tight junctions uh, that are supposed to be holding and maintaining that barrier between the uh, systemic bloodstream as, and the brain um, bloodstream. And of course, it has the anti-inflammatory effect, specifically reducing the inflammatory cytokines, but promoting the anti-inflammatory cytokines. When we're getting into the cell level, we're seeing cannabidiol the quench those uh, reactive oxygen species, those inflammatory substances that are inside the cell. It's also enhancing the mitochondrial function so that the brain cells are working again. They're functioning at much higher levels and they're able to process. They're also going to be prevented from going to cell death. Now, within the cell, we talked about the formation of uh, tau, uh, those neurofibratory um, tangles, um, as well as the amyloid beta. What cannabidiol is doing within the cell is it, it seems to be rebalancing and restoring communication within the cell. So a lot of these processes are returned. Remember earlier, I talked about tau being a misfolding problem, where the protein is actually problematically not folded properly. Well, cannabidiol has the property of restoring some of that folding mechanisms and getting it back to normal. The result is uh, we can have some profound positive results. So clinically, what kind of things am I seeing? Well, you have the potential and animal studies prove it, but we don't have any human studies. Now, on independently, I've got some anecdotes, anecdotal um, events that uh, demonstrate this. I've uh, helped about five different cases of Alzheimer's disease, and, and they all show clearing of cognition. They restore their memory, and then their balance of behavior, activity, sleep, learning, mood, and the social interactions normalizes. Now, I can't say that they are back to normal completely, but these are profound improvements. So I want to show you um, a brief video. It's one, in, one minute. demonstrates this. This is a, a client of mine in Newfoundland, and uh, she is a trisomy 21 Downs, uh, 62 years old, which is quite elderly for a Downs. <laughs> And that was in 2014. And then the next video shows uh, her sort of decline uh, into dementia, this angry um, and resistive. Now, after about three weeks of using cannabidiol Lovely. on a cream, uh, she's responding um, with her normal behaviors <laughs> uh, where she's, she's acting and she's saying things that are in her normal pattern. And then this is uh, something that she learned many years ago, but she hasn't practiced it uh, any amount of time. And so she's um, saying, uh, don't tell a secret and zipping her lips so that she won't tell it. So this is a case where um, she has uh, become manageable. She's become the person that she was. And this is not unusual. This is the characteristics of what I'm seeing with, Al with Alzheimer's disease. Now, a lot about what I talked about before doesn't really explain why people's cognition is restored. It says why you could prevent Alzheimer's and you could block it, but it doesn't say why it's being corrected. The only explanation that I have is that it seems to be communications at the synapses, uh, that it's got the neuromodulation is being restored, and that the connections are being made. There's cellular function going on and there's not the inflammation that's uh, taking place. So an overall recovery in, in so many respects. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any long-term studies to find out what's going to happen, but I have not had any of these clients report to me that they have had any type of decline, except when they go off of the cannabidiol. Now, I want to mention one other thing that you may not be aware of. 
Uh, statin drugs are being promoted very strongly, are being used um, in a broad range of uh, situations to lower cholesterol. Uh, as an anti it can also be an anti-inflammatory agent. But the, in fact, the evidence shows it only reduces the number of myocardial events by 3 to 5% after six years. However, there are 20% risk of adverse reactions. The main thing I want to tell you is that the, it's a total pathway inhibitor. It's involved with a mevalonate pathway. And why that's important is because that's the pathway that helps provide the folding for the tau molecules and the tau proteins. So without this pathway being operational, it could be that statin drugs could actually inhibit and cause greater problems and accelerate a type of Alzheimer's. We know that statin drugs have induced memory loss for extended periods in some people. Now, with regard to CBD in that, we're seeing neuroinflammatory modulation. Atherosclerosis is reduced the brain and heart protective features, as well as a whole body benefits that occur with it. Now, this is fairly unique to Alzheimer's disease. What I found is that low doses with cannabidiol can be very effective. And so rather than using the standard dose, I'm recommending that people use five milligrams twice a day as a starter uh, to get uh, control of the situation and then adjust every three days at the earliest and then make the adjustments relatively gently and there's different forms that can be used the trick is how can you get it into the patient because many of these uh, patients are obstinate and they're resistive it's difficult to get them to do uh, the normal things and and have the normal interactions the duration of action is a good 6 to 12 hours, but we're seeing extended uh, duration of these effects. And the target dose is actually quite low. We're talking about 15 milligrams per day as a total dose. Now, one of the things that I have to guide people about is if you're treating a patient with Alzheimer's disease, you need to watch them carefully. Now, they seem to be restored, but sometimes their decision-making is not as good as it should be, and they will do... Uh, things that um, could put them in danger. Uh, for instance, uh, walking into the road, uh, being energized to um, take part in activities or want to go driving when they still don't have all of the skills and the decision making that needs to happen to um, make all of that work properly and safely. <clears throat> so let's review and recap. We're talking about a huge burden of brain disease with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. We're talking about as well as endocannabinoid deficiency. And this is a common entity in these disorders, as well as all of the neurodegenerative conditions. CBD addresses all of these pathways of brain disorders, makes significant improvement almost immediately in their results. Now, some of them will take time to show up, the kind of results that we're looking for. Will they be restored completely? Probably not, but you're going to have the ability to prevent the progression of this disease in as well and the protective features that go along with cannabidiol. CBD is supported in preclinical studies and in practice, and there's no adverse effects, toxicity, or drug interactions. The dosing is low and the results are fast. I've put together a number of uh, materials, uh, documents, as well as some, some references that you can take a look at. This, these references are live and you can go to them on uh, Google Documents and pull them up. I've placed a copy of the slides there as well so you can see this again um, and you can gather up some of the material. We'll also be recording um, this uh, event and it's being done right now and we should be sharing that in the near future. I'm really delighted to have be able to present this information and share some of the clinical results that I've seen with it, and I am expecting to have many more of the same.